Bueno, pues eh, lo más de esta charla va a ser en inglés. Así mi nivel de español no es suficiente para, para hablar de este tema. Y también cuando intento eh, cambiar a Spanglish. Y eso es, eso es peor. Así me voy a hablar en inglés. Y, eh, pero si hay preguntas, eh, preguntarme en español, yo entiendo más o menos perfectamente. Y si hay cosas que necesitamos explicar otra vez, tal vez alguien puede traducir un poco. Vale. Vale. So, my name is Steve Purvis, and uh, I worked for many years in uh, oil and gas with back end software, data analysis, statistical machine learning and uh, number crunching. Uh, these days, the last four or five years, I've been working more with the web technologies. And these days I work with an American company called Xperia, who, uh, who do a whole bunch of things. So from backend databases with graph databases through to front-end applications like this. So we do lots of visualization work. We mainly work in React, lots of D3, uh, and we're just at the point now where we're starting to look at machine learning and bringing machine learning in alongside of the, some of the, the visualization systems that we do. <coughs> so to start off, what is machine learning? Who already knows? Okay. 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 So who's who's done any machine learning in, in sort of production and actually created some within? Who's played with it and done some experimentation and yeah. run some algorithms? And a lot of people haven't. Okay. But do a lot of people know what, what it is? Yeah, of course. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Good. So the formal definition and well the definition that I like is a field of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed or algorithms that, that do the same that, uh, that ad adapt and learn without being specifically programmed and years ago this used to be very quite applied to a small set of algorithms like neural networks genetic algorithms and some statistical models but now it's support sort of expanded into uh, practically anything these days, people are calling machine learning, which wasn't before. Uh, so we've got this umbrella term coming on. So what does that mean for uh, when, when people talk about machine learning? So again, what a lot of people are doing at the moment is really sort of the research or product uh, or project flow around machine learning. So they're picking up data sets, acquiring data, processing it, doing a lot of cleanup, aggregation, conditioning the data and computing other things called features, and using that to train something. And at the center of all this is this idea of a machine learning model. So uh, you choose which models you're gonna use, you choose the parameters, you train and you tune those. Then you look at the results, see how bad they are, and then figure out how to go back around the loop looking at the data. So a lot of times when people say machine learning, they're still thinking about that loop, and that really, that's data science, really. That's what a data science team will be doing, figuring out how to apply machine learning technology. And for, on big data sets, in order to do that, you need big servers. Most of the tools are in Python or some in Torch or in C. So when people say machine learning, oh, well, you do Python, yeah? Or they're actually thinking about that, I think. And that is an essential part of it, but that alone doesn't deliver the AI revolution that we're being promised where there is small bits of machine learning in almost everything that we do. So, sorry about the small text, but You've got that loop, which is the data science team, but to actually make these things work, there needs to be a production pipeline. There needs to be something 
that acquires data, applies the known version controlled, tested, cleanup and aggregation, extracts the features, the exact ones we want, and then runs the prediction in what's called a forward model, where we're not training necessarily, and in most cases we won't be, we're applying and making our predictions. And then that's got to be presented somehow so there's some interaction and visualization. And then the user consumes that. And of course, this is one part of a big system that feeds back. Uh, and then the data science team figures out how well they're doing in production and develops their model before, uh, further based on that information. So do you see all this happening in Python? I, I don't see all of this happening in Python. I see this is a, this is a infrastructure, this is DevOps, this is version control, figuring out how to publish models and snapshots. The models themselves are data. The folks who are implementing production scale web applications in the cloud, that's their domain. And Python is maybe there in the backend server, or it's maybe there in the browser further down the line. So JavaScript has places in here, as do other languages. It's definitely not just the remit of Python. But machine learning and JavaScript, what happens when you say that to someone? And it's, yeah, they just can't believe. Why on earth would you want to do it in JavaScript? It's, you know, Python. And sort of just seen why, because machine lear to make machine learning work, we've got a whole infrastructure to maintain. We've got to present things to users. We want interactive apps. Uh, so JavaScript's got a, a, a big place in all of those tools. It might not be doing the training of Google's inception model that takes a thousand hours, but it's doing the, uh, it's helping with the cleanup, it's doing with the data acquisition. It's presenting information to the users and getting their feedback. So it's important that uh, the JavaScript community is, uh, you know, is going to be a part of that machine learning revolution. So this is one response. And of course it's going to happen in JavaScript because everything does eventually happen in JavaScript. Uh, but there's a good reason for that. And that's community deployability, portability and interactivity. So I pulled this off a, I was looking for a, a visualization of why, you know, JavaScript developers are the most in the world and this is lovely GitHub little visualization showing, just based on GitHub's data, the similar data with Stack Overflow and some, but JavaScript comes out as the most popular language, the most heavily used language. It's ahead of Java, it's ahead of Python. And so there's this huge community of JavaScript developers that A, we should be drawing the, on their skills, but B, if these developers are developing the apps and the experiences around machine learning, you've, they've got to know what it is. They've got to understand it at least at some level to understand how it works, to be able to better uh, build these apps. So that's, that's response number one, is the community. Pregunta en español, sí. Sí, claro. No sé. Sí. Eh, la idea de usar JavaScript ahora es meramente por ser el más popular o hay más razones aparte de por qué es el más popular. Ah, ok. Estoy más de, pensando que no debe estar solo Python. Y mucha gente, cuando tú hablas con ellos de, sobre Machine Learning, es, es este. Es solo es Python. Necesita aprender Python. Bueno, well, no. Tú puedes hacerlo en JavaScript ta también. Estoy, y estoy enfocando en, en JavaScript. Pero yo creo que eso no va a cambiar porque los browsers. I'm going to switch back to English. It's because the deployability, it's the absolute best platform for deploying an application is the web. Uh, and then you do have Node if you're going somewhere away from the browser where you need a small server or a small embedded 
uh, you know, system, maybe in an intelligent sensor or something. You can use Node there, you don't have to use Python. A Node might actually have a smaller footprint than a, a Python uh, uh, distributable. So, and our, our browser is going to start implementing another language and replacing JavaScript. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Not natively. So we have the best deployment platform. And again, portability. JavaScript's actually quite compact. If you take a scientific Python distribution, like uh, Anaconda, uh, I think Anaconda gets up to a gig maybe, once you fully install it. There's Miniconda as well, but you're still talking about 300 megabyte of just install footprint. And with, with Node, you can, you can go smaller than that. And because some of the Node libraries are themselves small bits of JavaScript, you, you can mix up and match what you need for an application, uh, you know, and achieve something more more compact. And it's no, and again, it's inherently cross-platform, so it's portable. And then the next thing is is interactivity. I've used. Uh, we're going to be using a system called uh, Python Notebooks, which are very popular for uh, for Python developers and for data scientists. Uh, but even in them, it's difficult to get good interaction. Python has some tools called Bokeh, for example. It's one that allows you to put a web interface together, put sliders on it, and have data render back. But it's nowhere near as flexible as, as just front-end JavaScript coding. So JavaScript is always, I think, going to be the ultimate front-end for creating those visualizations. OK. So, apart from those reasons, and I think another few minutes and we switch to some code, I just get, this is the, everybody who you say machine le uh, learning and JavaScript to, they don't believe you, and, which is why I keep, keep going on about this. So application space is where you can contribute, definitely education. There's some lovely tools here for learning, uh, lightweight, some of the concepts behind machine learning. I recently did a one-day workshop in London, which is all using JavaScript tools. And in a minute, we're going to use some of the, we're going to look at some of the workbooks from that. The other big application space, I think, is this whole thing of uh, edge computing. That, uh, I think it would have slide. Yeah. So, who's heard of edge computing? The buzzword. And it basically means don't, the, uh, the, the big compute, stuff right in the middle of the cloud where maybe big models are are are, are being computed uh, isn't the place for all machine learning to happen and definitely not all of our production pipeline a lot of this actually has to happen on the edge devices which is specialized equipment embedded mobile phones computers certain amount of uh, the analysis the forward passes and the predictions should be happening locally on all those small devices and only being very particular about what data it sends back up for more computational power. That will make things more interactive, of course, and it, distrib it distributes the network load, the, the computer load. So here is something where JavaScript, I think, is going to play. That's another trend of why JavaScript and why not only Python is the, this trend towards edge computing. Okay, it's time for some code. So, one more slide before, a few more slides before code, but we're getting there. So, first of all, before we look at any of the code that I'm gonna look at, and before we think, okay, I have to pick up a library and start doing it myself in JavaScript, there's a growing set of, uh, machine learning services and on AWS there's a lot of hype about oh we've got a machine learning development platform blah blah there's actually though a subset of web services production ready that allow you to do do stuff so anything and this is a few months ago there's more than this now but anything around facial recognition facial emotion analysis image classification uh, some of this for video video face tracking and motion detection, that's now an API call 
from a JavaScript API. There's, you know, there's, there's multiple language APIs to, to do that in. And you can be doing that stuff uh, just with API calls up to AWS or Microsoft. So already there is a tier of stuff where if you're building an app and want ML, you don't even have to get into the ML. That's bringing it back into the normal domain of developing an app versus web services. So that's the first tier to think of. Then when you go beyond that, you start to get into how to develop and uh, yeah, develop your own ML pipeline uh, in, in JS. And I did a one day workshop on this, taking people through uh, some key concepts, classical techniques, which is unsupervised, supervised learning. And we did a little bit on neural networks as well. And what I'm going to do now is trying to quickly go through the items in green, which I think we've got plenty of time for because uh, that was only 10 minutes of talking. So first of all, who knows, who knows what unsupervised versus supervised learning is? Yeah, yeah. Another, another way to think about it is if you don't already have the answers, but you have the data, you're probably looking at unsupervised approaches. Because what you're trying to do is explore what the natural structures are within your data, cut them up, and see if they're useful for the question you want to answer. Supervised, you've got known data with known outcomes, and you can teach a machine this is please here if, if uh, i've got a lot of cats and dog photos and my list of which ones are cats and dogs machine please figure out the mapping uh, between between the two okay so we're going to focus in these examples on one type of problem which is classification which i've just described is this a cat is this a dog so taking some data and putting it into uh, into a class in this case it's uh, ovejas y cabras and it's just interesting that cabras walk more and like higher temperatures uh, it's obvious that's why we have plenty here and in this case uh, that is linearly partitionable so we can use a linear method in order to split the classes into two. Things aren't always linear, and sometimes in our data space, we can have very peculiar distributions. Uh, and you can find these distributions via unsupervised if they're inherent. So if this is actually much denser in the middle, and so if there's something inherent about the data over that separation, you can use an unsupervised technique or supervised techniques are the most powerful at trying to find uh, non-linear and more complex separations. Okay, so we're gonna use a system called Jupyter. Has anybody heard of those? Jupyter notebooks? A couple people have. So this again is started out in the Python world, but now Jupyter is a system uh, that runs all these different languages. I think there's 40 different languages. And you have to install Python to get it. But once you do, you can install whichever kernel you want. And it gives you almost like an IDE that is like a document. So what you're actually doing is writing a document and interlacing code, text, and graphics in order to, to tell a story. And it's really good for exploratory work when you're trying to figure stuff out and data scientists will spend most of their time figuring that, uh, working in that environment. So it's a good one for us to use. We're gonna be leaning heavily. Most of the stuff I'm gonna show is using a library called MLGS, open source, very actively developed, even though the, the first page you arrive on GitHub hasn't had a commit for two years, but the rest is in separate repos and it's been actively developed. And it's this type of library that we need to grow 
in order to help our, our ecosystem here. We're also going to look at some neural networks uh, using a library called convnet.js. So I'm going to go through this in the notebooks and uh, then we can actually click on some links and go out to some of the web demos and see some much fancier stuff happening. So I've got Python installed and I've installed the JP Babel kernel. So if I launch JP Babel, we get the uh, base notebook page up. And it gives you like a file browser for the local directory. I'm gonna open the first notebook. So notebooks are like this. Uh, yeah, I didn't put the, I've got the GitHub, I put the GitHub repo on one of the slides there. We'll be sharing the slide, I'll tweet the, I'll tweet the repo address afterwards. <coughs> But all of these are available online. So the idea now is just to show you a couple and then you can always go back and, and look and play with them later. So the notebook's like this. Uh, it gives you an environment. It, the JavaScript plays quite well. These are actually markdown cells, which we can run and they'll render. And then Hello Notebook is just to show you some of the JavaScript. So. We can just write plain JavaScript in there. Console log works. There's some ES 2017 support. Sorry, you have to specify the language in some place or like it can run anything right away? You have to install a kernel. Oh, okay. So we have installed Python and then using Node, I used MPN to install the JP Babel kernel and then the notebook's able to uh, recognize it and you just keep installing kernels and you can switch between them uh, yeah because yeah, for me it just appears like Python <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well you can go out with Scala you can pick up any of the 40 kernels available and switch to that language so we can do some async await which is nice uh, we can render graphics there's sort of a special variable on the page sorry uh, that we can render to and if you render to something to that it'll it'll mount it onto the DOM for you and we can do HTML images and any MIME type that we like so this first notebook if I just run the cells it's just picking stuff up rendering images here just rendering a div with some styles so you can do you can do a whole bunch of stuff hmm. Anybody know how to hide the bar in Chrome? C P. Oh, shift. Okay. Just a little. It's fine. It helps. So uh, visualization. I'm using something called Plotly. <coughs> Plotly JS, which is a visualization library, and we can we can drop in that to require. Here is some, uh, yeah, just plotting a parallel, uh, second order polynomial. The unfortunate thing, constant let doesn't play. If I try to run that, it works once and then we get errors, which is why I've got vars everywhere. I don't usually use vars. But. So that, that lets you understand what a notebook is. Oh, right. So, just to go through quickly, I can do cell run all. It's busy, right, it's rendered. And then we've got a whole bunch of plotting stuff available. It's pretty rich. We can plot services, 3D plots. We can plot images out, bubble charts. Good stuff. So we can do this data science in JavaScript. Uh, it's not just the Python folks. Right, so first we're going to look at a data set. So we're going to do a couple of different tasks on a particular data set. There's lots of machine learning data sets to pick up there. If you just go out on Google, there's plenty of repositories. 
So we're going to do a data set which is wine. So the idea is there's three regions in Italy that these samples have been collected from. And for each wine, uh, we know the class, so we know which label it's from. And there's also been a whole other bunch of measurements. I mean, I understand alcohol, flavonoids, and hue, and but, you know, somebody else is bound to be people in here that know wine. Uh, there's been a whole lot of measures on, on, the, on the quality of the wine, and what we want to do is try and classify which region it came from. So we do some CSV parsing. This stuff comes in CSV files. Uh, good old node, just read file sync, pass our data set. I'm adding in some titles. And then we get basically, we've just got tabular data that we can, we can load up. And that's our data set that we're going to be seeing throughout the next few slides. So if you do come back to this, the next set of notebooks is about uh, maths, where we introduce some of the math concepts. I'm not going to go into that now. It's because if, if you get a few things about maths, about vectors, vector spaces, then if you can learn that, then you start to see that all this stuff is actually doing the same thing millions of times or in complicated ways, but it's a, it's a, it's a good way to get into get the stuff into your head. So we're going to build the first classifier. And this was actually an exercise in the workshop. I had some of this set out and the idea was to write your own classifier function. So do we know what it means when I say classifier? No, okay. So it's a bit like this. So we've got a data set and for each wine we've got 13 different uh, measurements. So we've got a 13 dimensional scatter plot. So our analysis space has 13 dimensions. And all of these examples I've just picked two because we can plot it. But in reality, machine learning will use n dimensions, hundreds of dimensions, in order to find the patterns and the clusters that we're going to find in, in just two. So our job when we're classifying is if we have a data point X, so this is one wine out of our uh, collection. We have to decide which region this is from. And imagine we know that we know that the, the regions of the wines, the centers of those regions are here, there, and there. What we can do is we can say, well, let's just do the nearest neighbor. So if X is here, then it's from region C, northern Italy. And classification is the task of doing that assignment. So that's what we did during the workshop and that's what we can do. What we did is we took some data. I took out the alcohol. So we got a data set. I just ma used map, map out the alcohol and some measure. I don't know this is some measure that wine people know about. OX, DD, something. Uh, because they, they seem to cluster well. And then we wrote a function that just maps over the data calculates the Euclidean distance between the class and assigns it. So that's the simplest possible task is to do that. Ah. You have to run them from the top. Load the data. So there's our data, alcohol versus... And you can sort of see there's maybe three groupings going on there. I cheated and I'm the machine learning algorithm. I decided where the centers were. <laughs> yeah? And then my job on my classifier is basically to paint. Classes. Yeah? And assign each, I haven't got the colors right to the centroids, but assign each group of points to the separate class. And you start to get this thing where you can see the decision boundary of a minimum distance thing. So that's, that's classification, which is straightforward. It's not really machine learning because we haven't learned anything. I sort of put the classes on where I thought there, were, there was more density. So what we're going to do now is apply an algorithm called uh, k-means clustering. And this is an unsupervised learning algorithm. 
which takes our n-dimensional feature vector, in this case 2, alcohol in the OD metric, it does something in order to determine what the classes are, yeah? what, the, uh, what, the, what the class centers are. So what claim means clustering is it tries, does, is it tries to learn what the decision boundary is. So we've got all these examples in our training set, but we can receive a new wine that lands anywhere on our plot. So when it does, where should it fall? And where's this decision boundary? And it does that just by randomly initializing, saying let's pick one point and make that each class. And then it assigns, it does the classification, and then it computes the average position, which is different, and then it will iteratively nudge the center. And you do that a few thousand times, and your centers go to where the clusters are. It's okay, it's the first one you sort of use. The thing is, you have to know how many classes you're guessing at. But we know in this case it's three. So let's just load our data, pull out alcohol and the ODE metric, and then run our clustering. And we're only doing 100 iterations here, and it's done. It actually converged after nine because it's such an easy data set. We then plot out the answers and the separation and it just did the job that I did. So we've done that on three dimensions and imagine doing that on the whole 13 dimensions. There's no way that I could actually determine where those cluster centers are. As soon as you go after two, three dimensions, this is why you start having to rely on the machine and those algorithms. And we can go, let's go off piste, as it were. And when you're in here, you can play and just, for example, let's try five dimensions. Converged after 10 iterations. Clustering is very different. Who knows? Because now we're looking at a 2D slice through a 5D space, and this could still be accurate, but we've lost the ability to properly visualize what's going on. You have uh, like um, a plot in three dimensions. Can we, can we see that? To, to check out if, you know, if yeah, we could. Have, if, if I'm not going to do it now. Okay. I'll mess it up and then we'll use up all our time. Okay. But yeah, and if you, but we could do, and if, I had, if we had more time, I would pop back to the Plotly notebook. Yeah. And I think I've got examples. Yeah. Of, uh, I think you can do up to 5D plots. If you scatter plot, and then use color and bubble size, you can get up to 5D, but then it's getting difficult, it's getting difficult to interpret. That's 4D, so that's using class and then bubble size to represent another. And then 3D, it's a really good lib plotly. Right. So that's the first thing, that's unsupervised. And k-means is the most simple. There are ways to figure out k. There are statistical things that can go and track uh, uh, and, and find out where these distributions are and fit little probability functions. There's a, there's a whole bunch of other techniques that this leads to. And as ever, NPM is your friend. <laughs> there's actually, uh, MLJS is quite a big library. But if you look out, people have started to write just little regression libraries, a little library to implement that from that paper. So there are, uh, for example, expectation maximization. Uh, yeah, that's one that goes and fits little probability functions to the data instead. And that's going to have different parameters. It's going to work where k-means doesn't and, and so on like that. So there's actually 
there's quite a few little libraries out there and you can reach out and, and get stuff. So that's unsupervised k-means. Uh, one, one thing more to note is in this world we're a bit lost as well. We've done, we've done unsupervised learning and we've got these blobs and we've got these classes but we don't really know how we've got nothing to ground truth it against. You then have to take that out into the world and test your answers with somebody to figure out if it was right. So it means there's not, there's not we, we struggle with validation. Uh, the best you can actually do is assign a confidence to every metric of how, how if this is class one, but 90% class one, or this is class one, but 60% class one or 40% class two. So that's the best you can do in unsupervised. Uh, I'm gonna look quickly at supervised. So this is a different scenario. I want to just zoom out to take the picture. So it's a different scenario. We've now got a training set as before, but we've also going to use our class labels on our training set. We're going to train something and then we're going to actually uh, look at its labels and then figure out how, how good the match was. Did it get it right? Compute an error and use that to train the system. And there's, this is neural networks, which have drawn something neural network in there. But also there's a whole range of classical techniques that work in a supervised manner. We're using one called k-nearest neighbors. And all that does is progressively look from one class to collect the k-nearest neighbors from the surrounding classes. So it's like it builds a graph. It starts somewhere, it looks around for the for the three closest neighbours and says, right, they're probably grouped. And then it'll go out and look for its neighbours within some threshold. And it'll use that to sort of grow a cluster out across the, uh, the data set. I'm not see, hmm. Uh, some of this needs fixed. But I don't, I don't have a picture ready, but this can, this can classify in non-linear situations. You can have a data set that curves around each other and the key nearest neighbors will, will follow the boundaries. So let's just quickly run that. Done, so we've trained it. We're gonna make some predictions now. I mean, the training is simple. Look, just require ML, K, and N. Inputs, labels, go for three nearest neighbors, generate the K and N make some predictions. Now, first plot is the actual answers for the training set. The second plot, and I can't get them side by side, is the predicted. And it's done pretty well. The issue is the data set doesn't have clean boundaries. So it's misclassified some lines because it's looking for nicer splits. So it's done quite well. And again, but how do we determine what the accuracy is? Well, alongside these machine learning algorithms, there's tools in there to be able to compute how well it's done. And there's something called a confusion matrix that we can compute. And what you want the confusion matrix to tell be is high values on the diagonal. Because that's saying what was a class zero got predicted as a class zero. So, and so these are correct predictions. These are six instances where we thought class one was class zero. And then you can use that to visualize how well your data is done. And you can also, there's a whole host of metrics you can put out. The F1 score is a typical one. That, so we're getting like 90% plus accuracy, which is not surprising because we've trained it on a data set and we're using the same samples from our data set. So it should do really well. How, you know, the real challenge is how to do, uh, how it does on unseen data. In Python world, they have a whole bunch of tools that let you do cross validation, where you just stick our training set in and it'll keep 10% out 
train with 10, train with 90, do with 10, and then randomly shuffle it a thousand times for you. And MLJS has got that in as well, cross-validation. So those tools are available to, and they can use that to really figure out how accurate things are. But now we know how well the thing is doing, which we didn't with unsupervised before. Right, I'm gonna quickly do the same thing with a neural network. So, we're loading our labeled wine data set again. Uh, usually when you do, yeah, usually when you do any of these algorithms, you'll take your data and you'll do a lot of cleanup. You'll normalize, you'll adjust the standard deviations, you'll tidy things. We haven't done any of that in the previous examples. And to be honest, on this data set, it's so simple that we don't really need to to get a decent result, but neural networks have another layer of sensitivity to them. So I've done at least some pre-processing in order to center the data around zero. So we get rid of the absolute nature of the value and now we have relative values. We pick up ConvNet.js, which we're gonna look at in a second. Load the data into volumes. Define the entire neural network, which is just pushing JSON objects, JavaScript objects, onto an array. We define an input layer with two dimensions in, a hidden layer with 20 neurons, and an output layer that is expecting to output three classes. We put that in a network. We train it. Ah. Did I run everything? We train it. It's still running. This takes a bit longer. See the star? We're doing, ah, yeah. It works with 100. I was just messing around. We're doing 10,000 passes across the whole training data set. It doesn't need that many. And we get some statistics out about how well it's trained. We then make predictions and plot the results. And again, it's done pretty well. Uh, but with neural networks, but it hasn't done well as the classical technique. We were had accuracies up in the 90s. We're now down 84, 87. And uh, I think the mantra you hear in ML is use the simplest model that works because it, sometimes when you go for more complicated models which are more powerful they're not necessarily better for for your data set okay so they were all simple examples and there's a there's a whole repo there full of notebooks which are still a work in progress i'm still fixing things and tidying things up but there's if you're interested in more there's stuff to play around with if you go to the convnet.js website, there's a whole bunch of examples of more sophisticated deep learning, uh, neural network based stuff, which you can, you can go and you can actually play with. So this one is doing image classification using a conventional neural network. And What's good about it is it's they, they've laid out their demo web pages so you can see each stage of the network. You can see what's happening when the things are training. And you can see the results. So this one's classifying the ImageNet database, which is a huge database of labeled images. And if you leave this long enough, the idea is that you'll get the highest scores on the green, where it means that, yes, it guessed the right answer. Uh, but what's good about this for us is if you go to their repo, all well, their source codes there for how they built these pages. And that's the beauty of the thing in the notebooks. We can, I've been experimenting in the notebooks and laying out the computation, but all that is directly loadable into the browser. You just need to webpack it and you know, you, you, can, you can take all that stuff and immediately put it in an app with visualization. 
So I would recommend having a look around the Convnet website. You can play with some of the examples, change the number of layers, take things out and see how well it behaves, if it can match simple data sets. Break it and make it too silly or too dumb to be able to classify something. <laughs> so it's it's good playground to play with, but importantly the source code is there so we can see how it's built. <coughs> is there any uh, OpenCV implementation in JavaScript as in Python in simple CV? Sorry? Hay alguna implementación de OpenCV, la librería de Sumama de reconocimiento de imágenes de computer version? Uh, probablemente, no sé. No sé si conoces, pero hay una muy famosa para Python de, uh -huh. de Simple CV. Yeah. Okay. It's bound to be. <laughs> yeah. It's bound to be. So, another, another quick look. I mean, there's loads of loads out there, but like with anything on NPM, is it actively maintained? How, how mature is it? Is it a bunch of students that have left university or is it active, an active team? But there are, there's a few things out there that's been properly developed. So I just want to talk about quickly about the, the other aspect of this. And this is coming back to remember our deployment pipeline and our production machine learning system. Uh, and that we had in the green along the bottom. What we looked at in the notebooks is this uh, data science environment where we can experiment and we can figure out which tools to use on our data. And then, yeah, we can lift those out and we can do training in the browser. Or we can just save our trained weights, load it in the browser and do the classification. Well, what's happening is there are libraries, and this is called the forward pass. So what I see happening in a company who's doing this is you've got the data science team versioning models, which then get deployed into production. And that happening constantly. And from the talks I've heard of people doing this in real, they talk about the whole DevOps infrastructure that you need about models beyond just the software. Uh, and so what's happening in JavaScript is what's happening is some of the big libraries for Python, deep learning and stuff, are building JavaScript libraries and actively maintaining them to do just this so that you can take the forward model and actually apply it in the browser. So what that means is you can take advantage of thousands of hours of compute time and just to, and use that as the core of your image recognition app or yeah. Uh, well, a famous one is, the, is Google Inception, and they've got a Python notebook up here showing that, which is a massive neural network that has been trained on millions of images. So already this stuff knows how to label, this network knows how to label and find things, find objects and images already. And all you have to do is the forward pass. And this one's done in Cafe. Uh, and all you would do is load the cafe.js library, load up that data from, from file or from an API, and then you're ready to go, you can, you can, you can, you can classify. And so yeah, I've just explained it, haven't I? So <laughs> this is what I, what I just explained. So you can take advantage of all that training, this massive architecture that some really smart people have already figured out for you. And you just load one of those snapshots in and immediately you're deal dealing with cat photos. There's some more demos here. And I'll just we'll have a quick look at one of them. Uh, but here exactly is the Google Inception network, which is loading now. So this is using keras.js, which is a different library again, maintained by the main Keras team. 
uh, and it's using that to load the weights into the browser and then it'll do some image classification. What's good about this repo, if you go to the repo, there's a demos folder and this is all built in Vue, Vue. Mm -hmm. so this is a Vue app. So if you go in there, there's some nice, very nice organized code where you've got the view and then you've got nice blocks of plain JavaScript showing you how to apply the Keras models. So for learning and figuring out how to build something yourself, that's a really good repo to jump to. All right, we need to select an image. Hmm, a cheetah. And of course, these demos are set up to show you how the thing runs through the neural net. And this is, this is running. So something this size working in the browser? Yeah, it might, it might take long, but maybe it's in your node server on your own back end. But this network is, is mess massive. <laughs> so you don't, you don't, it, it finished. And it was pretty sure it was a cheetah. So you can, you can bring these things in and what you're seeing is other than this, which is massive, there are other models being stored. You can go to GitHub repo and find people's models that they've trained. And as well, if you imagine yourself working in a company developing the front end tools for this, you're going to be loading the models that their own internal teams have built for detecting insurance fraud, for, I don't know, for, for doing whatever your company does. This, these models are going, to be, are going to be artifacts that you're going to be working with. So have a look at those. There's lots of fun things to do. Hmm? Uh, and accessible implementations because we can go and look these guys demos and figure out how to uh, how to implement this stuff so we showed keras.js this cafe.js again with its own demo site uh, and also neocortex and deep learn doing the same thing so there's there's little libraries popping up to do this. KSJS is interesting because it's maintained by a, an open source foundation. The same with Cafe, where these are more independent startup y type things, so maybe less robust. So, so, yeah. so it's definitely great for education in the JS. You don't have to learn Python before you can get into machine learning tools. And, but there are real applications in ML deployments for some of the analysis from the learning. But beyond that, that broader workflow, JavaScript's gonna be a big part of it, even if we're not doing the training. Jupyter's great, but it's exploratory work. Uh, yeah, well, the ecosystem's growing and there's lots of stuff on NPM and it's not all about Python. But I think if you're gonna get into machine learning, via JavaScript, then Python's in your future at some point. But it, it doesn't have to be for everything. Okay. So the slides will be up there tomorrow with all these links and the, uh, the notebooks are already up there at Experiment Machine Learning and JavaScript. And we're hiring. <laughs> but, okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, I'm a completely new to this subject. Uh, I've never done anything with machine learning. Um, although I could understand some of the things you were told, uh, more, most of it sounds still pretty abstract to me. Yeah. And so I would like to know if there is any book or reading uh, or introduction
There's an awesome list. There's a couple awesome machine learning books. Have a look around for awesome lists. Yeah, because there's, there's quite a few mini repos on GitHub. I've got far too many bookmarks. So I'm not going to try and find the ones I've seen already, but uh, that's going to point you in the right direction. Because I haven't read, I haven't read many books. Uh, I've, did, you know, well, recently, but this I've all gone off the stuff on the on the web. I'm not sure how many current books there are. This stuff's changing so fast as well. Uh, Oh. There's one, the deep learning book. It's a, this is a print book out there by, by, by Goodfellow, Ian Goodfellow. And apparently this is just for the neural network side, but apparently this is very good in terms of the first one, two chapters are like 200% mathematics. But his concept is, like I was explaining, if you can get that, then the rest of the book is using the toolkit. And if you get a little bit of the vector space, the linear algebra, then everything else is just it's, it's reapplying the same concept. What, what do you study? By the way? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because to be honest, the, the very first linear algebra that you do, vectors, inner products, projections, and trigonometry, that's, that's the core and base of it. It's just building up some insight into, into why it works. And I think that book's good at it, but uh, it's having a look at here. Check out some of those awesome lists because. I've read more than one that has beginner's section and, and has good... Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The, the famous ones are there's a course by somebody called Andrew Ning or NG and on Coursera. That's supposed to be good. And... Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that example we saw, Keras JOS was GPU enabled. I think it's playing around with WebGL in order to do it at the moment. But yeah, uh, it it depends. Again, how much training are you going to do in here? Don't know. The pass and the other the other bits and. Depends on the app. Some machine learning things are sucking data out of a database and everything flows down to the user, you know, whether it's a recommendation engine or, or something. But there are other applications where somebody might have a mobile phone because they're collecting the data. So the job there is to, to clean and to prepare. Or another good one is, is video processing. Imagine somebody trying, imagine you're trying to recognize stuff in video streams. There's no way you're going to stream the video to a server to do that. So you need some machine learning here to be able to recognize, is there a frame that probably has something of interest in? Then that frame goes up to the next level, which is more accurate. That says, yeah, it's definitely got something in it. That goes back up to the next level to do the more intelligent part. And that's one of the things with this edge computing is that sort of spread, enough computation here to be able to decide whether to go up the different layers. So back to your question, how much compute power do you need to be able to do that? Maybe it isn't all dependent on being able to use a GPU here. Maybe the computation can be quite light. There just needs to be some decision at this level, not all the four to the server. Yeah, you're, you're never gonna train in the device. You just apply 
No, yeah, I think rarely in the device. There might be some nice little applications where somebody's offline out in the field or out in the mountain collecting samples and the thing happens to cluster to tell them has he collected enough data before he's got his data set? They say, whoa, but I'm biased. Keep collecting. <laughs> oh, everything goes green. That means out of my thousand samples, there's a good diversity. So that's machine learning. It's not the ultimate goal, but that's building some intelligence in at the right level and at some greater pipeline. Okay. okay. I hope the English wasn't too difficult. Uh, it's recorded, so you can pause me. You can pause me. And <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs>